1 John chapter 5 tonight. 1 John chapter 5, at least to start. Just a couple of verses to set the stage for our message tonight. And 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13 says this, He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. We'll just leave it at that tonight, and we're going to take a look at our message tonight that I've titled, Secured by Grace. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll look to this tonight. Lord, we thank you for what's already gone on before tonight, that we could sing praises to you, and that we could share in fellowship together. We pray that you would uh, now help to our hearts to be tuned to your word tonight, allow your truth to penetrate into us and change us, and we pray that these moments might be meaningful as a result. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We've been going through every Sunday night different doctrines of the church, doctrines that matter. And uh, tonight's uh, is uh, the, the second part that we started last week. Last week we talked about how we are saved by grace. Tonight we're going to talk about how we are secured by grace. And here's our statement from uh, the church doctrinal statement. Here's what it says. We believe that salvation of the sinner is holy of grace through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that all the redeemed once saved, are kept by God's power and are secure in Christ forever. So, secured by grace. The question tonight is one that is a, is a hot-button issue for some, of, some people. The question is, how is, can I lose my salvation? And if I can, how, do I, how, how does that happen? Because we don't want to have it happen, and some people are worried about that. Uh, they, they, they know that they come to Christ and they, they've accepted him. And now sometimes people get worried and they lose that confidence. They, they worry that maybe somehow they can, you know, not make it in at the last moment. And, uh, and of course, there are some groups that teach that. And, you know, we, we, have a, we have a specific doctrinal statement that we would adhere to here that I think is, is more readily supported from Scripture than the, the other viewpoint. And that, I think based right even out of this passage that we looked at, uh, is kind of our starting point tonight to be thinking in this way. Um, here we see in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12, he says about having life, and he says, here's why I've written these things in verse 13. He says, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. If you don't believe in eternal security, you can't really ever know, right? You always got to wonder. You've got to worry. You've got to, hey, maybe, maybe I did something that God's not going to let me in at the, at the end. And so I think we see this time and time again in Scripture, times where the Bible seeks to reassure us that if we know Christ and if we're in Him, if we have our new life founded in Him, if we are truly saved, in other words, we, we can have confidence. God wants us to have sure, a surety. He wants us to know. He doesn't want us to, to worry and wonder through life. And so we're just going to pick apart this statement. Here's the first, the first part of it. It says, all of the redeemed once saved. So have you ever heard the phrase, once saved, always saved? That's kind of like the byline for people that believe in eternal security. Uh, it's the idea that once you're saved, you're always saved. So the question is, when are you saved? Okay, the fact of the matter is, let me get to, to where this question comes, comes about. How do I know if you're saved? Do I know if you're saved? I'm going to argue that I don't. I don't know if you're saved. I can see evidence that says, looks like you're saved, or evidence that maybe that you're not saved, but in the end, I don't know whether you're saved. God knows if you're saved, right? And you know if you're saved. Because it's something that's an internal. It's based on what? Faith. I can't see faith. <laughs> I can't hold faith. I can't measure faith. There's no way for me as a, as a third party to look at your life and say, boy, they have saving faith. I don't know. 
I can see evidence, but I don't know really what the heart is. So in other words, other people don't know. We see someone make a profession of faith. We sometimes use that. What does that mean? It means someone says, hey, I've accepted the Lord as my Savior. Okay. Are there any liars in the world? <laughs> yeah. Some people, you know, may, may just want to fit in and they'll use the language and they have it. They've, they've said it. They make a profession of faith. I, I profess to know the Lord as my Savior. And maybe they do and maybe they don't. I can't be their judge. I can say I can rejoice. I take it honestly. When someone tells me that, I take it at face value. And I say, they say they're saved. They profess to know the Lord. I'm going to take that at face value that that's what it is. If they're not, that's between God and them. He's got to sort that out, right? So people profess to know. You can observe things in their life. You can say, boy, he says he's a Christian, but does he really act like one? Have, has his life really changed? Are things different? Is he really coming to church? Is he reading his Bible? Is he trying to love the Lord in things that he sees in their life? Do you see evidence of their works? Remember James said, show me your faith by your works. That's what we are to do. That's, that's, a, that's an evidence of our faith. But we don't get to judge the heart. There's people who will say they are redeemed and really aren't. And there's people who will, maybe we don't know that there's evidence or we don't see it. And in the end, maybe they are redeemed. Maybe they have had faith. Maybe they, they have that at some point. Or maybe it's something that they have, you know, towards the end of their life. You've seen lots of examples where people, towards the end of their life, they, they, they get faced with some, you know, cancer or some other de Ill, illness that, that might affect them. And all of a sudden, it wow, I need, it, I need the Lord. And, uh, and we don't know. Um, what we do know is, in the end... Jesus is the one that's going to separate us out. Um, let's turn to Matthew 25. Here's just an example of what's going to happen in the end. Because even Jesus was trying to tell us, hey, don't waste your time trying to figure out who's who. <laughs> because that's a job that's going to come to him in the end. He says different times, you know, even as the example of the shepherd. He says, my sheep know my voice, right? And I know them. But... He knows whether they are or aren't his sheep. And here's the example again of sheep and goats. A lot of times we had examples of here's a mixed, a mixed group of things. The sheep represent the truly redeemed. The goats represent the ones that weren't truly redeemed. And in Matthew 25, verse 31, what does Jesus have to say? He says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them. One from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And, of course, we also know Jesus gave us later a parable of the wheat and the tares. Same kind of idea. He's going to separate us out. So when we, we delve into this issue of, once saved, always saved. It's not like I can sit here and say, hey, these people are the ones, those people aren't. Uh, that's, not, that's not my place. I don't know. All I can say is they've professed. They have evidence of faith. And so I presume that they're true, truly redeemed, born-again people. But what does, if faith is the thing that saves us, okay, what... Where do we get to the point where faith makes a change in our life? Well, we go back to Ephesians chapter 2, right? By grace are you saved through faith. So you have grace that comes from God, and we, we, we enact, we, we accept that grace into our life by faith that we, that we put in him. So faith is obtained by God's grace, right? We're saved by grace. We talked about this last week. We know that there's this component of our own choice to believe or have faith, but really it starts as a work of God. We remember we even talked about this last week. Aren't there some people who just, when you go to share Christ with them, they're not ready? 
you can tell God hasn't be, been at work in their heart. They're just, they're not receptive. They're not interested. And then there's other people, you come and you say, wow, I hardly said anything. And they were just ready to receive the Lord. Well, God works by his grace in the hearts of people to draw them to himself so that when we present the, the truth of the gospel, they are ready to respond in faith. So we have God's grace involved with this. So all the redeemed, once they're saved, is who we're talking about. Let me just talk about two other facets of this. What happens when we are redeemed? Okay, these are some of the big, the big theological words again. One of these words is regeneration. Okay, regeneration. That's, the, that's when we come to the Lord, we accept him by faith. At that moment in time, sometimes we use the word we are born again, right? We, we are, become new creatures in Christ. It's the it's instantaneous, supernatural impartation of spiritual life. Life that we didn't have before. Oftentimes we see scripture talking about we used to be dead and now we are made alive. And this is a work of God that happens in our life. What do we do to make ourselves born again? <laughs> we don't do anything. It's an act of God's grace in our life. That's why John 1 says this, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we get born again, it's not because I was bloodline, made it into the right family. It wasn't because I had enough willpower to do the right thing and to change my life into, from death into life. It wasn't because I've got, you know, people teaching me and showing me the way. It's not the will of man. No, it says when we're born again, we are born completely, entirely utterly dependently on God's work in us. That's what regeneration is about. And so we see that happen at the moment we are born again. We accept Christ. So regeneration, being born again, is a work of God. It's a work of God's grace. I'm going somewhere with this. So our faith is a work of grace. Our regeneration, being born again, our new life in Christ is a work of grace. We have another thing that happens to us when we get saved, and that is justification. What does that mean? It means that we are declared righteous before God. Even though we aren't righteous, even though we aren't right, even though we aren't holy, God says, I look at you through Christ's righteousness, and I'm going to declare you to be righteous even though you're not. That's the idea behind justification. It's a, it's, a, it's a judgment that God gives us, a positive one. <laughs> it says, I judge you to be righteous. The gavel goes down, case closed, don't bring him back. He does, there's no, you're never going to get tried again for this. That justification happens at the time we accept Christ as our Savior. That's why we see in Romans 3.24, uh, Romans being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 5.1 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see justification, just like everything else, is an act of God. We didn't do anything to argue our case. We didn't do anything to say, I deserve to be declared righteous. No, we came to God by faith. And it's through his grace that he declares us righteous. And so here we have all of these things that happen at the moment of salvation, all works of God. And all works of God are works of grace in our life. Okay? So, you're with me so far. All the redeemed, once they're saved. So once you're saved, all of the points of being saved are related to a work of God in your life that came about by grace. Okay, so let's take it to the next phrase, which says, once you're saved, you are kept by God's power. How often, when we think about eternal security, do we say to ourselves, well, you know, I, 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 I accepted Christ, but I didn't always follow him. 
I accepted Christ, but I did some bad things. And you know, those bad things, I don't think God's going to forgive me of those things. They're just too, too bad, you know. What happens if you say, this should never happen? And you're right, it shouldn't. What happens if someone accepts Christ and then goes out and murders someone? What happens if someone go, uh, accepts Christ as their Savior and goes out and, you know, commits armed robbery? Whatever it is, you know, what happens if they, they, they accept Christ and, and, you know, they decide, you know what, um, I, I get a lot further ahead in life by, you know, lying all, everywhere I go <laughs> because I feel like I can get ahead. And it's just so much a part of my life telling the, telling the half-truths and manipulating people around me that, you know, I, I just can't seem to shake that. And somehow we say this is a dichotomy. It shouldn't happen in our Christian lives. But yet we know that it does in some people. And we say, in our own human logic, God's not going to let you in. <laughs> you can't be that way because God's not going to let you in. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says we aren't kept by our own power. We're not kept in a place of, sal of being saved by doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing. Okay, so let's reverse it. You say, look on the other side of it. I got saved, I cleaned my life up, I quit the cussing, quit going to the bars, you know, I, I, got, I got rid of the, all the bad friends that I have that were taking me down the wrong road, I did all the right things, I, you know, I started reading my Bible, and I became just as righteous as you can imagine. <laughs> now, you'd say, we'd all sit here tonight and say, well, that's what a good Christian should do. And I would agree with you. <laughs> That's what a good Christian should do. But does doing those things keep us saved? <laughs> no. No more than not doing those things makes us unsaved. Because how do we keep saved? How do we stay saved? By God's power. And God's power is always, again, an act of grace. John 6 Let's turn there. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 37 speaks to this. John 6 and verse 37 says, Jesus speaking, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So Jesus is telling us here that if these are people who we like to use the word in big theological circles again, the elect. <laughs> if these are people who, who really got saved, who were really chosen by God to be part of his kingdom, that, that accepted Christ and truly had that act of regeneration, that washing, that new life that they got in Christ, Jesus says, hey, I'm not getting rid of them. <laughs> Doesn't matter what they do. He says, I'm in no wise going to cast them out. That's what he says. He says, whether I... Of course, we know Jesus loves us all, right? But he says, whether I like them or not, <laughs> whether, I, whether I care for what they're doing or whether I don't, he says, I am not going to cast any of these people out because my Father's will is that I don't lose a single one of them. He says, he says that, that's his will, that I should lose nothing, but that I have a work to do in them. I shall raise them up again at the last day. That hope of the resurrection that we have in Christ that comes through Christ's power and his own resurrection, Christ says, because they are, they are my fathers, and they are ones that have come to him and been regenerated through my righteousness, he says, I'm not losing them. They're kept by God's power. So there's nothing that we can do or anyone else can do to make us lose salvation because Christ isn't letting us go. He says, I'm, I'm not... You know, you might try to let go, but I'm not letting go of you people. 
If God's grace, so think about this logically. If it's God's grace that allowed us to be admitted into his family, why do we think that he's going to kick us out? <laughs> why do we think that he's going to somehow, you know, take us from that position that he sent his son to die for us for? God's grace will keep us where God's grace has put us. I like 1 Peter 1, 3 says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the, fa by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay. So we are kept by God's power. Kept all through life. Think about this. We just talked about the fact that when you get saved, you go from being dead in your sins to alive in Christ. So who's going to make you dead in your sins again? God? Is he going to say, oh, well, you got saved, but your sins were too much, too great. I'm just going to turn the switch back off. That's not how God works. He makes us a new creature in Christ. He makes us alive in him. There is no sense of you are now going to get the light turned on and off. And some people say, you know, you can get saved and resaved and get back again and come back into God's grace and leave it, leave it again. I mean, how, how many times do you get born again? How many times do you have new life? You only get once, right? We only get born into this world once. <laughs> And we only get born into God's family once when we get born again. And God's not about to take us back out of that place that he's paid so dearly and used his own power and grace to get us there. It doesn't even make sense logically. So we are kept by God's power. And then the third part of this is that we are, I'll read it again, all the redeemed once saved are kept by God's power and are secure in Christ forever. So we're saved by grace. We're kept by God's power, by his grace. And why is that? Because we are secure in Christ forever. You're already in the book of John. Let's turn over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 gives us some more insight Again, Jesus speaking. And in verse 20 of John 17, here's what he says. Um, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He's speaking about praying for his disciples and how they would continue in, in, his, uh, in his word and, and things like that. And he talks about then that shall, those that shall believe on Christ through their word. That would be us. The word's been handed down through generations. And he says, verse 21, and what's the result of this? That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. So we see this bond that happens. And, and I don't know that we can explain it really that easily. But somehow when we come to know Christ as our Savior, we, we, we have this unity where we're placed in Christ. We talked about justification. How does God see us? He doesn't see us the way we really are. He sees us through the veil of Christ. Right? The Bible says we are in Christ. It's Christ who wraps us around in his righteousness. That way when God sees us, he sees us through the righteousness of Christ who died for us. So we have this union that happens between us and Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, you know, I'm one with the Father. 
He says, and the people that believe on me are one with me. He says, we have this unity together that, that's a special bond. That's a special union. And, and that gives us a sense of security when we realize who we are in Christ. Martin Luther, the great reformer, had this to say. He says, when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. Think about that. I think the people that feel like we're going to lose our salvation spend too much time looking at us instead of looking at who Christ is. Because Christ is how we got saved in the first place, right? And it's his righteousness and it's his grace at work in our life and our union with him that ultimately keeps us in a place of security for all eternity. Union with Christ. It's this inseparable spiritual bond between the believer and Christ. It, it occurs at the moment that we get saved. We, we, we begin with this union. And the believer who is in Christ identifies with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We, that's why we have the picture of that when we have baptism. We have the picture of that identification with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. That gives us this common unity, not only with each other, but with Christ. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. Yeah. Christ is a resident. He takes up residence in us in some way. We have this union with him that we didn't have before. We have Christ living in us. We live. We're not the same person that we were before, though. We continue to breathe and eat and do the things that we do. But the person on the inside has made a change. There's a spiritual difference, and that difference comes from the union that we now have with Christ. Colossians 3.3 3 says this, Ye are dead, your life is hid with Christ in God. In other words, the old person you were, that's not who you are anymore. <laughs> that person's dead. Now, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, speaking to this great security that we have, this great union we have with Christ who is in God himself. And that's why Romans 8.1 gives us the great assurance. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear condemnation because of our union with Christ. Because of who we are in Christ. We don't have to fear that, wow, I might get condemned someday. Okay, now all this talk about being secured by grace makes us nervous sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> because the, the, the fact of the matter is, it even made Paul nervous. <laughs> That's why he was like, you know, you look at some parts of Galatians and you look at even some parts of, uh, of Romans and you see him talking to the fact that, you know, let's make sure we don't, you know, make this just the liberty to sin. <laughs> Let's just make sure, hey, just because I know that I'm secure in Christ, that I'm one with him, let's make sure that doesn't mean, hey, sky's the limit. You know, let's go out and do what we want because God's never going to get rid of me. Uh, no, he says, no, God forbid, he says, right? He says, we should want to live for Christ. We should, because of our union with him. That should, that should the Bible says, the, the love of Christ constraineth us, right? It pushes us into this, into this desire, this driving um, impulse to, to live for the Lord. That's what it should be doing to us. It's not a, a license or a liberty that we now can just say, well, I can, you don't have to worry about that because I'm secure in Christ. <laughs> no, our, our unity with Christ should, should drive us to the, the good works that we know we should do. So we have unity with Christ, and we also have an adoption that happens into Christ's family. And adoption is this, of course, in, it's the same idea as we have in the real world here. Adoption is this act by which you get placed as a son into a new family, as if you were born into it, right? We understand that concept. We're born, we're born again. We're born into the family of God. 
Romans 8 says this. It says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I'm sure in the world we live in, there's probably cases where people get adopted and then get kicked back out of their family somehow. But I, you know, you think, boy, that's a really sad case <laughs> if that really happens. But honestly, I would think virtually everybody who comes to the point where they decide I'm going to adopt a child into my family, they, they for the most part, say now they're part of my family. They're who I am. They're, they're just as if they were born here. That's who it should be. That's how it should be. And this is how God sees us. He, he says, you're, you're adopted in. He says, Christ is my son. He says, but you're going to be a joint heir with Christ. <laughs> he says, you're going to be an heir of God. You're going to get all of the, the great spiritual benefits and blessings of being my child. Galatians 3, 26 says this, You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And it's by God's will and by God's grace that we get adopted into his family. Why would we think that he would remove us at some point because of that? We are, I think when we, when we worry about our eternal security, I think we're worrying about the wrong thing. Because if we emphasize the work of grace that has to happen in our life to come into God's family, why do we so quickly abandon that work of grace for how we stay in God's family? It's, we have to be kept by God's power. We still need God's grace every day in our life, don't we? Sometimes we think of this as, a well, it's that grace that happened, that he admitted me in, and I admitted I'm a sinner, and, and that act of grace... and. And then it's like, boy, now, now I'm on my own. <laughs> I got to try to pull myself up by my bootstraps and, and get to work and make it happen. And, uh, you know, God does want us to do things, but the fact of the matter is he knows we can't do it. He can't, we can't do it on our own. We need that Holy Spirit within us. We need that union with Christ. We need to be kept by God's power. We need God's grace every day of our life, don't we, in order to continue to walk in the steps that we are to walk in, to be able to abide with him the way God wants us to. We have to find a way to realize God's grace is at work in our life all the time. We need to continue to have that grace until he calls us home and rely on that same grace <laughs> because it's the same grace that saves us. It's the same grace that keeps us. We're kept by God's power. We're secured by grace. So I hope that helps a little bit tonight. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that we are saved by grace, but we thank you that each day your grace is at work in our lives to keep us by your power until that day that you call us home. Help us to cling to your grace. Help us to uh, pursue your son, abiding with him, growing closer with him, delving deeper into, into your word each day to, to know more about him. And I pray that you would help us to have confidence and to know that we have that eternal security, that you won't lose any one of us who have truly been redeemed and have come to you and been born into your family. We thank you for that fact, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.